Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Norm Feudy, creator of the new daily comic strip, Gill. Stick around, because if your local newspaper doesn't yet carry Gill, I have a feeling by the end of this interview, you'll be asking them for it. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of real people whose lives only make it seem like they're trapped in a comic strip in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Does anyone else think that daily comic strips are a lot like local radio shows? and that cartoonists have a lot in common with disc jockeys and talk show hosts? All right, you're probably confused, but so let me try to explain that. There are hundreds of daily comic strips in the world, and your local newspaper might carry 30 at most. Now, where I live, for example, there are strips that I see in the Tampa Bay Times that readers of the Tampa Tribune don't get, and vice versa. Similarly, a morning radio show host that everybody in the Tampa Bay area knows as hysterically funny is virtually unknown 90 miles away in Orlando. Like I said, I see similarities between the two professions. Which is my odd way of saying that there are a lot of great comic strips and radio shows that you'll never see or hear. Now I can't help you much with the radio end of things, but let me try to turn you on to a new daily comic strip that I think a lot of people will enjoy. Gill. Created and drawn by Norm Feudy, the strip centers around a chunky eight-year-old boy whose parents are divorced. It's a thoroughly modern take on family life that's drawn in classic comic style with a totally 2012 voice. As for Gil, he struggles with school and his appetite. His 1960s style mom, complete with polka dot kerchief always holding back her hair, balances the demands of being a single parent with sustaining a career. And dumping Gil's slovenly dad, who the boy only sees on alternate weekends, was the smartest thing she ever did. Oh, and did I mention that Gil's best friend, uh, Chandra, is also the product of a broken home? Now, maybe it doesn't sound like comedy gold the way I described it, but there is definitely a market for its style, tone, and jokes. If Charles Schultz was starting out today, I suspect there would be threads of Gil found in Peanuts. You can sample Gil online at Gil Comic, Gil Comics with an S, dot com. Uh, one other interesting note about Gil. The strip actually started in 2008 as a web-only comic. Uh, Feudy abandoned it uh, after about a year and a half before taking a second successful run at print syndication in 2011. And Norm Feudy, welcome to Mr. Media. Hi, Bob. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you here. Really enjoyed getting to see the strip. Uh, and, and ironically, <clears throat> I'm having you here. I actually had to ask the syndicate for examples because the Tampa Bay Times, my paper, doesn't carry it yet. So it's exactly what I'm talking about. Right. <laughs> it's brand new, so it's, it's going to take some time. Yeah. Um, now, a lot of conversations about Gil have centered on this issue of divorce. And, and I understand that you yourself are actually a child of, uh, of divorce. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, my uh, my mother raised me and my older sister uh, by herself, very very close to the the uh, the comic Gill's mom is, is modeled very much after my own mother, and uh, yeah, she worked in a factory to uh, to raise us both. Mom have the kerchief. She did. That's really where that's from. I mean, it's sort of a visual metaphor for for working mom, but uh, yeah, that's where it comes from. She she worked in a factory uh, making assembling screen windows. And uh, she used to have to cut down the uh, the aluminum so that it would get shavings in her hair. So she she wore that like pretty much all the time. Well, it's a very uh, I said '60s in the introduction, '60s '70s kind of a thing that you just immediately you you know it's funny how when you when you draw a character I guess and you you settle on something that will be that identifying factor of hers. Yeah, that that's a great one. Um, yeah, you know. Mom, yeah. 
I was born in 1970, so yeah, you've got the time period down right. Have to be, yeah, a little bit, a little bit after 1970, <laughs> obviously. But I mean, she, and and you know, she reminds me of the mom in uh, Family Circus, who I don't think wears them now, but did for a long time. Would have yeah, her hair back that way. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't have noticed that. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Now, I'm, I'm curious, and I won't spend too much time talking about this whole idea of divorce and the connection, but I am wondering, uh, what do you remember about your own upbringing uh, that sometimes may have set you apart from kids and families where there were two parents, uh, you know, in the household? Well, you know, it's, it's funny that you should say that. I, I think it's actually kind of the opposite. Growing up, my parents divorced before I was old enough to even remember so I don't ever remember my parents being together. I was too little to remember that. And I grew up in a small rural town in Rhode Island. And I would have to say 60, 70 percent of my friends were in the same, had the same family structure at home where you know, their father or maybe their mother wasn't there. They're raised in, in single parent households. So it was actually very normal to me. And I didn't know that, <laughs> that it really wasn't until you know, maybe middle school that I realized, uh, you know, most people don't grow up in that structure. So it, I guess it's like, I, I know uh, I, I worked on a book with, uh, and this comes up whenever I talk to cartoonists, but I worked on a biography of Will Eisner and I spent time with him and his family was extremely poor uh, during the, 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 the 1920s and yeah. early 30s. And, you know, I would ask him about it. And he said, you know, it was all we knew. So that was, it didn't, you know, we didn't feel poor. We, you know, we knew we struggled, but that's just the way life was for us. So, yeah, I, I kind of, you know, I grew up in the seventies. You know, there's a you know, funny how things have come full circle. There's a big recession going on back then, uh, and yeah, my my mother was providing the only income for us. So yeah, we were we were pretty poor too. But again, we, you know, I, I look out, I look back on my childhood fondly. We we had uh, I had a great childhood. And I didn't really even realize how, that we were poor until, you know, maybe high school when you start becoming more socially aware of uh, what level all your, your peers are on. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I grew up, uh, in retrospect, I would identify it as lower middle class uh, in, uh, in central Jersey. And I didn't realize, you know, you don't realize when you're in middle school, as you say, that there are classes in terms of, you know, social strata and economic strata. But, uh, you know, I recognize that looking back, but I just thought that's just the way everybody around me was. Right, and, yeah. You know, it's not until you get to high school and college that things yeah. start separating. And again, growing up, I think most of my friends, their parents were divorced, and they were, probably, they were in similar economic uh, situation to me. So, uh, yeah, that was all normal to me. Now, what uh, were you a comic strip, uh, comics uh, fan uh, as a kid, or did that come later? Uh, you, you know, I've always been a fan of uh, cartoons, animation, uh, like any kid is. Uh, you know, I don't think I really, I didn't really get into newspaper comic strips until I was about 12 or 13. We moved to Colorado, and uh, a boyfriend of my mother's gave me a, a copy of Loose Tales, his first Bloom County mm-hmm. collection, and uh, I started, I read that thing straight through, and I was like, wow, this is, this is great, this is funny. Um and that's kind of what really sparked my interest in newspaper cartoons. And very shortly after that, I mean, this is the early 80s, so then Farside, Calvin and Hobbes, and it, was, it was just sort of this boom of great new comics that came out. So that's really what sparked my interest. Were there, were there strips that uh, did not appeal to you at the time? Um, well, I, I guess you could say that there weren't many strips that appealed to me, uh, other than Peanuts, I suppose. Um, my exposure to that was mainly through the, the television specials, you know, the Christmas specials, and just, you know, because it, those are just huge. Those are things that you got excited about every Christmas because it, it was on once and you had to be in front of the TV to see. <laughs> um, so in, in sort of a, an indirect way, that was sort of a, a way that uh, maybe the first comic that I was sort of interested in. I don't remember reading that in the paper as a kid, and it wasn't until... Like I said, I, I was older that I really started to uh, get into it. Now, uh, it's interesting to me that uh, the, the, the strips that you mentioned uh, getting into first, Bloom County and Farside, and, and I don't mean this in, in a bad way, but I mean, uh, Gill, for example, is, is nothing like those. It's closer, I think, in reading to Peanuts than it is to Bloom County. I, a lot of people have made that comparison because there is... Uh, 
there is sort of this undertone of, uh, you know, a bleak background to him, and he's very much an underdog. Uh, so, yeah, I, 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 I totally get that, yeah. And I, and I, I am a, you know, I, I do read uh, Peanuts as well. This wasn't something that, um, I don't know, for whatever reason, I guess maybe I'm the exception to the rule. I, Peanuts wasn't the first introduction to me like it was for so many cartoonists. It was just the way it happened, I guess. Now, but um, it's a comic. It's one of the best of all times, obviously. It's, it's interesting to me, uh, and I've seen this too, and, and, and I promise I'm not going to spend the whole interview talking about this divorce issue, but it is, I mean, it is kind of central to the strip. Sure. Uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't see anything about divorce or separation in Peanuts. It really wasn't that world that was touched on. But um, were you surprised at all the commotion about Gil in that regard in that um, the, the comic strips really haven't dealt with this topic? Kind of surprising. Yeah, not head on. I, I mean, I, I can't say that I'm surprised because <laughs> newspaper comics are, by their nature, sort of a, 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 a tame fare. Um, and there are, I mean, there there are a few strips uh, in the past that have maybe single parent characters or or children who are living maybe with a grandparent or an aunt or something. So it's sort of implied that their uh, you know family structure is non nuclear. Uh, but yeah, no, nobody really seems to take on the whole <laughs> mom and dad have split up and this is how the world is for me. Yeah. Now, I, I got to take issue with you saying that the daily comics are fairly tame. I think any time that uh, uh, Mark Tatuli and uh, Stefan Pastis get a hold of somebody else's strip, they seem to be quite violent. That's <laughs> true. There are exceptions to the rule. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, true enough. Fair enough. Um. I'm, and uh, I, I was thinking that the strip, uh, Gil, that the strip, uh, it starts out from this place. Now, you've, you've done it on and off the last couple of years. It's not like it just started yesterday. But that it probably starts out from a place or started out from a place um, that you were, knew very well in terms of your own experience and this, this single mom and you know, making ends meet and you know, making friends and this, you know, the, the general struggles that a kid has no matter how many parents in the house he has, whether he has a man and a woman, whether he has two men or two women, whatever it is, there's sure. the same thing, some things that are universal. But I'm also thinking that maybe once you got going in the strip when you first started it, 2008, 2009, um, that it sort of takes on a life of its own and it gets beyond your, your own experience that you bring to it. Yeah, and I think, I think it's, true of, uh, it's true of a lot of comic strips. I mean, you, you have to start out with a premise and, and some basic ideas where your characters are. And then the more you write for them, the more they grow and the more uh, ideas you have. And yeah, absolutely, they do take on a life of their own. Um, what kind of things has, have surprised you? Things that have come out of Gil's mouth or things that he's done, or, or the mom for that matter, uh, that maybe you wouldn't have expected when you started? Oh, jeez. Um, I guess the thing that surprised me most is that I kind of... I guess Gil is not quite as bright as I, <laughs> I I didn't I didn't set out to make a character that was not precocious and I don't know if that was just sort of a, a subconscious thing that I added along the way um, but I, I mean the typical comic strip kid that you think about is, like a Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes is, is very precocious is very you know wiser wise beyond their years and I just as I uh, wrote more and more for Gil it, it, it seemed a lot more fun to sort of uh, write him as uh, a little bit on the dim side sometimes, and in, in, a, in a way that, in reality, kids are. I mean, <laughs> you know, my own kids are, uh, you know, all around that age. My daughter's ten, and my, my son is six, and they're smart kids. But kids say, you know, dumb things. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess uh, maybe that's a little bit of me coming out. I, I you, you know, I, I consider myself a average intelligence, but I never felt like I was the smartest guy in the room. Uh, so maybe I'm just trying to relate to that sort of feeling that everybody has, you know, everyone may be just a little smarter than me, <laughs> or how people feel sometimes. Anyway. I, I don't feel that way. <laughs> just, I just want to, you know, be clear about that. All right, that's fine. Um, now, I want to ask you some more questions about Gil, but you were also kind enough to offer to maybe do a little drawing for us 
while we talk. Mm-hmm. So I, I wanted to say if you wanted to uh, yeah. pull out your uh, uh, board and, 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 uh, and stuff. Uh, now, and, and I'll, I'll tell people that you're a little sensitive about that you, 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 you draw first in pencil. So while you, I, <laughs> you will be drawing, it, it may be a little faint in the, for those yeah. of you watching on video, but uh, we will show you the finished uh, uh, product. Uh, yeah, and I'll try to ink over that uh, when I'm done, but I, I'm very much a pencil first. I'm not good at going straight to ink, and I'm very self-conscious about that. But anyway, you can go ahead. So uh, while, you're, while you're drawing, I mean, tell me, how did, uh, you know, how did you learn your craft? Uh, is it just by doing? Did you go to school? Uh, I didn't go to school for it. I, I, I've always liked to draw, and I think most, most kids uh, do. Um, I very much self-taught, uh, and, and I, I kind of taught myself by copying comic strips out of the newspaper uh, after I really started to get into them. So I would draw you know, Bill the Cat or, uh, or Opus or, or Calvin and Hobbes or Garfield, any of them. You know, I would just practice... Um, making those trying to get those to look as, as, as close to the actual cartoons as possible and then after a while you know you just sort of get tired of copying other people's characters and you start making up uh, characters of your own and I, I've heard from a lot of cartoonists that that's really the way that <laughs> they kind of learned how to how to create these stylized cartoon characters as well so now, I mentioned uh, uh, Gil's mom. Does she have a name, by the way? Uh, in the strip, her name is Cheryl. Cheryl. Okay. I guess I haven't uh, I haven't come to that yet. But um, so I, I I I mentioned before that uh, we recognize her immediately from the uh, the kerchief on her head that's keeping her hair contained. Uh, you know, we notice uh, uh, Gil uh, has a very distinctive head. It sort of reminds me of uh, Hagar turned upside down. <laughs> because you know it's kind of a round fa- head, and obviously he doesn't have facial hair, but the top of right. his head it has these very thick stubs of, yeah. of hair, and it's very distinctive. Oh, he's also, can we say, roly poly? Yes, he's a, he's absolutely a, a pudgy kid. Um, you know, it's funny that when I, when I create characters, I, I really start out um, trying to, you know, I start out with a personality in mind, and then. You know, once I, I know what the character is and what I want to say with them, then then I kind of switch over to well, what's this character going to look like. And and when I when I when I'm sketching ideas and and trying to settle on the design for the character, that kind of fills in some of the personality too. So you know, when when I when I got the sort of aha sketch um, for Gil, he was so yeah, he was this rotund uh, little guy. And, you know, I, I kind of built that into part of his, uh, uh, you know, underdog character where he's, you know, the, his uh, girl at school, Morgan, is one of, one of the things that she's constantly sort of picking on him for is his weight or you know, he doesn't have the cool things that she has. <laughs> so, yeah, it's sort of half visual, half just thinking through what the, what the characters are going to be. Has he uh, gained or lost weight since you first started doing him in 08? Um, about the same. I look back at some of the, you know, when you do a strip for a couple of years, um, you know, the characters uh, naturally sort of morph and, uh, and, and change as you sort of hone. I mean, they sort of evolve into the ideal form that you have in your head, but, you know, it takes time to, uh, to get onto paper. So he's smoothed out a little bit. Maybe he's a little less big than he he looked uh, originally. But um, I feel like he's about the weight I've always envisioned him in my head. <laughs> it wasn't an intentional wall. I better make him, you know, trim down a little bit. It was really just, uh, you know, the way he evolved. So I want to hold up. This is <laughs> this is a finished gill and people who are looking at the video right now can see we can act, we can see Gil he's he's got his hand up and we're exactly. starting to see him come to life there yeah it's great um, and and what about I mentioned about his hair I mean that's an interesting thing it, yeah uh, it's very distinctive has, has the, the hair been that way from the beginning did you it has yeah. it has yeah the shape of his head has changed <laughs> it's, 
flattened out a little bit, but he's uh, yeah, that 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 hair has been there from the beginning, and that that was that was part of the aha moment where I, I had a uh, uh, two two uh, two of my cousins when we were little. They had um, always had crew cuts, and that's sort of the the inspiration that gave me. How do I visually stylize a, a crew cut in, in the most simplistic way? And that's sort of where the where that came from. Well, I want to show. I mentioned uh, it looks his head sort of looks like Hagar upside down. This is his dad, uh, and you can see that his dad's face is somewhat Hagarish. Uh, you know, he's got that permanent uh, day old beard, maybe two day old beard in his case. Um, do you? Uh, okay, back to a divorce type of question. Uh, Gil's dad does not come off very well in anything I've read. We haven't seen any redeeming human characteristics in him yet. Uh, any relationship there to feelings towards your own dad from way back, or just uh, just what's what, where, yeah. the way it's come out? No, not really. I mean, um, I mean, <laughs> my dad was part of my life. He wasn't around very much, um, and you know, I don't want to slag on my own. <laughs> <laughs> father on the internet but he uh it, it's it's not my dad um but the i guess the overall uh thing i'm trying to get across with dad and part of the thing uh one of the things that i felt as a kid so you know what when you're growing up in a single parent family like i did and this is you know by no means how all single parent families are most fathers vast majority are, are involved in their kids' lives, and, you know, divorce is just a, a thing that happens with, with a lot of couples. Um, but in my case, you know, my dad wasn't really around, and, uh, you know, he had some issues. And it, what I'm trying to convey in the strip is not so much that, um, it's not so much about who the dad is, but uh, how you kind of overcome having, you know, one parent who's not perfect, who's not a hero, who's, uh, you know, um, it, it's part of what I'm trying to get through uh, the strip is uh, how uh, kids are very uh, resilient in that respect and how they kind of view adults and how they, how they get through despite, you know, whatever challenges life throws at them in that respect, so... I think we found, in, in, you know, for those of us who've read comics for a long time, uh, and, you know, when a strip has been around for many years, as Gil eventually, I, I suspect, will be, uh, we, you know, all the characters wind up getting that opportunity to be broader, more well-rounded. Uh, I'm thinking right. of uh, Zonker in, uh, in Doonesbury, for example, who, you know, for years was just that zoned out uh, <coughs> doper, you know. It, but then we find over time that he's got characteristics that, make him apparently a good person to help, you know, nanny a kid. He raises a kid. He's got a big heart. And, you know, maybe we'll yeah. find that uh, Frank uh, Frank has some of those characteristics. Well, and you will, absolutely. Uh, one thing I should mention, uh, when, um, when I ran the strip online, one of the things that the audience really appreciated um, is that, yeah, Gil's dad is this harsh character, uh, much more harsh on, in the online <laughs> version than <laughs> And I've made him in the newspaper, um, but over time he he did begin to show sort of these redeeming characteristics, and it's difficult because the pacing in a strip is is sort of that you have to tell this you're telling a very long story in very short bits uh, over uh, a very long period of time if you're lucky. Um, so I, I have to show Dad who Dad is before I can redeem him. So it's it's sort of a uh, you know you gotta kind of stick through there and you, you you'll you'll see those qualities come out of him. No, no obviously nobody is is all bad um so yeah he, he's gonna definitely grow through the course of the strip oh you know in jessica rabbit's case she was just drawn that way um That's <laughs> sorry look at that there is gill folks say hello to all of our viewers those of you listening on radio just have to imagine a chubby young kid waving at you um <laughs> Now, the, so the strip has a this interesting history, and oddly, it's it's actually the inverse of Mr. Media. You wouldn't know this, but uh, Mr. Media rocks. Yeah. Oh, now I'm going to have to ask for the picture. See, now you've okay. done that. 
Um, Mr. Media has this kind of inverse history. It started as a, a weekly syndicated newspaper column that Universal yeah. distributed, and then uh, the newspapers didn't really they didn't really understand what a URL was in the mid '90s. <laughs> so, so we kind of gave up on it and put it aside, and then brought it back in uh, 2007 as an online as a podcast. Right. And so we've kind of the opposite direction you've gone. You, you, uh, just to explain to folks, you originally created it, tried to sell it to a syndicate for newspapers. It right. didn't. It didn't catch on at the time. It may not have been the right. The strip was probably right, but it may not have been the right time for that particular strip. You went the web comic uh, route, which was building steam at the time. Right. Um, how did that go for the year and a half that you did it? I, well, I did about five days a week uh, for a year and a half, and it was a great experience. Um, you really learn um, because you're 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 interacting with the audience on, on a regular basis. I mean, it could be good and bad, but uh, I got. A lot of feedback. I really kind of figured out what worked with Gill and what didn't. Um, so, at around 2009, uh, I had some other uh, freelance projects that I needed to devote time to, so I, I had to let that go. Um, and people were disappointed, and I was too. But it it was uh, it, it wasn't. It's the kind of thing I didn't really have a, a goal for in mind as far as the web goes. I just wanted to create this thing and put it out there and see how far I could go with it. Uh, and then uh, it was about 2010. I said, well, you know, I'm going to give it one. I was looking through some of the old material, and I said, I'm going to give it one more crack and see uh, see if I can take the best of what I've created so far and uh, uh, send that to my editor, who's very, uh, King Features, who, who, was, who was very supportive of it in the first place and who had been following it. Uh, while I did it online as well. Is that Brandon? And, yeah, Brendan Burford. Yeah, he's been on the show. We know Brendan. Yeah. So uh, and uh, yeah, this time the you know the planets aligned, so to speak, and uh, they felt uh, they could go forward with it. So it's great. It definitely. I mean, it it definitely seems to be a time where we don't we haven't had a new kind of family strip that really kind of hit the mark in a while. There's there's a lot of there's always a lot of strips out there. That right. are they're kind of a you know very narrowly created or you know they they appeal to a certain this I think I, you know I, I'd say this even if you weren't here in front of me <laughs> I, I think it I think it just has a very broad appeal it it captures um, something it probably could have captured ten years ago as well because of the, the yeah. issues but it just seems to really work right now yeah and and I I hope that continues to be the case I mean one one of the things uh, I know they look for is, is sort of in comic strips when, when editors talk about you know what they're going to pick up is sort of uh, uh, a strip with an authentic voice to it. And so I, I guess what I have going for me with this is that you know it, this is a strip that I'm just I'm just trying to tell a very genuine story and it's a very personal strip to me, so that sort of worked. <laughs> and and the, the the subject matter I think is you've gotten some good media on this uh, USA Today. Yeah, uh, I mean, and it, you know, I think the divorce plays into that. People see it as something different. You know, they they're not they don't write stories in USA Today about every new strip that comes out. Right. Yeah. No. It's it's been fortunate to care, uh, catch a lot of uh, media attention uh, because of yeah because of the subject matter. I mean, I you know I, I like to remind people that it's it's more about it's more it's not just it's not about divorce. It's right. about a kid who is uh, you know a product of divorce. Um, but yeah, it's a big part of the strip, and it's that's what makes a difference. It's what people are going to talk about. It's a starting point for the conversation. Right. Yeah. Now, Gill is not your first or only strip. You also do uh, retail, which I, do. I have to admit, I, I'm embarrassed to admit, I had never heard of retail before. Gil. Interview over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just for what it's worth, I didn't know. I, Mark Tatuli, I had him on uh, just within months of Leo starting, and I didn't know that uh, he was doing Hearts of the City at the time. And I still, I still haven't seen many newspapers that it's been in. So you know, sorry, Mark, I love you, but you know. So some, but again, it comes back to that whole. Uh, that whole DJ thing I was talking about. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, uh, DJs work in a, you know, in one local environment, unless they're on like Sirius or they're syndicated. Uh, cartoonists are syndicated, but they're, you know, fighting your way into that kind of distribution system. It's, it's hard. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, retails in about I think seventy newspapers you know, throughout the U.S. and Canada. So it's well known in some markets, you know, and a lot of others. Nobody's ever heard of it. So it's got a nice loyal following, and I've been able to uh, you know make a living off of it. So I'm going to keep going with that one. Well, that's. I was curious about that. If that was enough to make a living, or if you were still doing other things on the side. Sure. Well, I mean, I always you know pick up projects on the side when I can because. I always use a little bit. I mean, I'm not making a fabulous living <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of the thing with uh, with comic strips. You can you can make a living in that in between mark where you know you're you're doing that comic that most people haven't ever heard of, but but it's out there. Yeah. Now, are you uh, you're doing two two strips simultaneously? Uh, yes. Is the workload you know, starting to appreciate on you, or you, you know, think, do you have anyone who helps you, or are you doing everything yourself? Uh, no, I don't have anyone who helps me. Um, I am doing everything myself. Uh, I, I'm just glad I, I've been doing retail since 2006, so I'm in a very good routine with that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, taking on two strips right out of the gate, I don't, I don't think I'd be able to keep up with it, but but I'm in a good rhythm with it. I, you know, I, I uh, the, the workload is. I know how to, to parse it out throughout the week. So, so far, I, I've been all right. Yeah, one of the, uh, and we'll wrap up in just a minute or two, but one of the challenges I, I've always found as a, someone, the outside looking in, is, uh, you know, for retail and now for Gill, two very different uh, topics. But nonetheless, you know, you have, uh, you have to come up with hundreds of ideas every year for each strip that basically come back to a general theme. There's a connection. Uh, that's, you know, is it easier doing two and having two different topics, or is it harder now because you've got so many, so many more ideas you've got to come up with? Well, it, uh, it's actually, I, I've fo- so far I've found it easier and, and a little bit liberating. And part of the reason I, I created Gill in the first place I started doing retail in 2006, and I actually worked in retail for about 15 years. Um, and that's you know, where the idea for that came from. Um, and my editor at the time, one of the things he said is the longer, longer you do this, the easier it's going to become. And that's, that's counterintuitive to you when you start. He's like, oh, the longer I do this, the fewer ideas I'm going to have, right? Uh, but you, you develop a rhythm and your characters grow and you just, it just builds it snowballs and you're able to, to uh, it, it becomes easier to create. Um, but, you know, I've always wanted to do kind of a family strip from my point of view. And retail is a very specific setting. And of course, I can take the characters out of that setting occasionally to you know, do jokes that aren't related to retail, but those are uh, the exception to what they're talking about in the strip. So uh, Gil kind of frees me up for all those ideas that I have that I can't really fit into uh, the retail comic. So this is sort of a, uh, a, uh, a vehicle for all my other comic ideas. So in that respect, it's, it's kind of a good thing. There's five, I think, five essential characters in Gil at the moment. Will that, will yes. that roster expand over time, do you think? Will it, have, uh, it, it almost have to? Yeah, there, there's uh, one other character who is not really a main character. is Mr. Klopek, who lives. He's an older uh, fixed-income gentleman who lives downstairs, who's kind of a grump. Um, there was a character in the web version of the strip uh, after... Uh, about a year, Mom uh, had sort of a boyfriend who uh, is, it was sort of a positive influence on Gil. Uh, he's probably going to come into the strip a little later on after uh, people get to know the, the main characters. So, And I'm sure other characters will pop up as I think of them. Will Mom have sleepovers? Is that allowed in the King Features universe? I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know how directly I can, <laughs> I can speak to that. <laughs> I mean, well, all of uh, Gil's uh, interactions with this uh, fellow have to be outside of the home, so nothing is implied. Um, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't think they'd have to be outside of the home. I'm Maybe. just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just, <laughs> Maybe I, I not have breakfast in his underwear. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could spare us <laughs> that. that yeah. Over the top. It may be enough to occasionally have to see Frank and having breakfast in his underwear when Gil's uh, having his alternate weekends. Um, 
<laughs> well, listen, uh, folks, you can, uh, you can look for Gill in your local newspaper seven days a week. We're available. And if your paper does not yet carry the strip, check it out online at gil, G-I-L, comics.com. Then you can send your local newspaper editor an email, as I suggested at the top of the show. You might want to, suggesting that he or she check it out as well and, you know, urge them to put it in the paper. Um, Norm, you've got uh, the website. We mentioned gilcomics.com. I think you're, yep. uh, you're all Twittered up and uh, Facebook. We can find you yep. in all those places. Absolutely. Um, a lot of fun getting to know the strip. I will. Uh, I'm definitely going to put in a word at my local newspaper. I hope that they will pick it up. I, I think there's a few uh, rather tired strips out there that uh, you know it might be time to try something new. Although I have to give the, uh, in fairness, the Tempe Times has done a great job the last couple of years of picking up uh, some strips that had not been seen in this market before. So I don't want to. I don't want to beat on them for that. Uh, I was very excited when we got Mutz a, a year or two ago. Um, anyway. Uh, Norm Feudy, uh, thank you so much for joining us in Mr. Media today and contri- contribute, continued good luck with your work. That was a blast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. For more original interviews, surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. If you've enjoyed today's show, subscribe for free to Mr. Media via email, RSS, or iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Another good idea, download our new free Mr. Media mobile app in the Android market. And you can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many parts of the Internet. Show your support of Mr. Media by supporting our sponsors, including Audible. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com radio. Again, that's audibletrial.com radio for your free audiobook. We're also supported by thepartyauthority.us. Call DJ Ira for all your party entertainment needs nationwide at 1-800-DIAL-DJs or visit their website, thepartyauthority.us. If you've got an idea for a guest, a comment on today's show, or would like to advertise on Mr. Media Radio, email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. You can also call our 24-hour listener line at 1-727-498-4711. Some messages may be used in an upcoming show. And unless you live next door to Mr. Media, there may be a toll charge. You can also follow Mr. Media on Facebook, Twitter, or our new YouTube and Vimeo video channels. Thanks so much for joining us today. I always appreciate you sharing a piece of your day with Mr. Media. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Hi, this is Guy Kawasaki. You're listening to Mr. Media, you poor slob. Hey, everybody. This is Bob Andelman from Mr. Media. First of all, I want to thank you for years of support uh, listening to the show. We're starting our sixth year. It's hard to believe our sixth year uh, as 2012 starts and heading towards our 1,000th online podcast, uh, audio and video it's uh, pretty amazing, <laughs> frankly. Uh, I remember starting it several years ago thinking, this will never last. And podcasts, that's as stupid a word as blogging. But here we are, <laughs> starting our sixth year and heading up to a thousand interviews. And I want to thank everybody for uh, listening and supporting the show. I also want to tell you that, uh, you know, one of the things that's been very helpful for this show is Stitcher Radio. Yes, this is sort of a commercial. Now, there are millions of smartphone apps in the world, but I only use one several times a day, Stitcher Radio. I build my own radio station to listen to broadcast and online shows when I want and in the order I want. CNN News Update, Onion Radio News, WTF with Mark Marin, MSNBC's Morning Joe, Studio 60, the TechCrunch headlines, and, of course, Mr. Media. It's free. It works on iPhone, Android, BlackBerry, Palm Pre, and much more. And you can get it for free for yourself. Try it out. I guarantee you're going to love it. Stitcher.com slash MRmedia. That's Stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. You're going to love it. And thanks again for supporting the show.